for all fiscal officers. At the same presentation, 18F, which is a federal government IT group, um, and they're working with integrated eligibility, they gave this presentation and they handed out this workbook called De-Risking Custom IT Projects. And their target audience was exactly people who are making these decisions, funding them, you know, how do you, how do you manage these enormous projects? And a lot of what they recommend is what integrated eligibility is doing, smaller, doing smaller chunks, trying to buy smaller pieces. Um, but it's, it, it's about this big, I brought in my hard copy. They talk about user-centered design, agile software, who owns it, they're like state should own the product, you don't let the vendor take it when they leave. Um, modular contracting. They also had this thing required demos, not memos. I mean, it's really, it's you say? demos, not memos. memos. Good. <laughs> so they're saying like, don't let the contractor come in and say this is what we did. Have them come in and show you what they did. Because I think a lot of times contractors come in, demos, not. and so Got this, it. this it's not a hard reading, and even if you just read the bold, it's a really interesting thing. And as you all review projects and move forward, um, like I said, integrated eligibility is doing chunks of this, so you will recognize it. But it's certainly not. It's 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 a hard. It's a real transformation in how you think about funding and managing big IT projects, and it's it's hard for you know to change way people's ways of doing. It. And procurement's a big part of it, so it's mm -hmm. it's I highly. Is when that you're bored, now on NCSL's uh, website for it, the conference? You said, you said it's it's too. I sent the link, and yeah. we've actually posted oh, it on okay. this committee page. Mm -hmm. um, it's not on the NCSL because it wasn't part of the major okay. uh, program because yeah. it was just the fiscal officer program. But you do have it, and there's a press release also that um, I can send to you if you want it. But it's really it's fun reading. I mean, it's fun reading. It's more fun than some other things I'm reading. <laughs> really? So I, you know, even when you're not bored, it's it would be it would be useful for you all to read it because you're going to be getting continuing to get projects, and I think. Um, Dan Smith found, I think he uses a lot of this also, and it's a useful way for him to think about analyzing projects. So yeah, I, one thing that was really important that you mentioned was the notion of looking at uh, true demos of what it mm -hmm. is you're buying. Because I remember in, in dissecting the Vermont Health Connect, there were actual demos of things that involved software that had not yet been written. So the demonstration that was actually presented was fraudulent. Mm -hmm. Mm. So demos. <laughs> it's not just demos. It basically you've got you need, to, you've you got to have, have some integrity in view of what you're yeah. getting to make sure that you're not getting a black box that looks as though it's working, but it actually is not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Catherine, I wanted to just clarify the audience for that is legislate. It, it is the legislative branch. Is it, handbook, is it state it's, government it's in general? The state budgeting and oversight is okay. what that you look at. So it's for people. It, it's not for the IT specialist. I mean, it is in this big picture, but it's really written for people like you, for finance and management, people who are being asked to fund and think about projects. How okay. do you, how do you, what are the right questions to ask? How do you want to manage it? Okay. One of the other things I want to mention they do talk about is you, you need to hire in good IT staff. You need to have people in, in, your, in your business or in your state government who are good also. You can't just outsource everything. Like, you need some people inside who are good. So that speaks to you know, hiring budgeting for that kind of thing as well. Um, well, that again was one of the things I know that we talked about a bit the last time, yeah. and that was the ability to hire people at the levels that you need given the salaries that the state was paying. And again, if you take the Vermont Health Connect as an example, the lowest paid person from any of the contractors was earning more than the people who were providing the oversight at the state, state government level. And I just remain concerned as to whether or not in the hiring structure that we do without some sort of an override, a market factor adjustment, if we're actually able to hire people at the competency levels we need to provide the oversight that's required. That has been a perennial issue yeah. since mm -hmm. the 70s. Although we see that wage disparity between state government and um, uh, even nonprofits, look at hospital salaries, mm -hmm. look at you yep. know a variety. Yep. So um, it's, it's it is a challenge for um, government. Um, it is absolutely challenging. I will say that one of the things they so this group 18F is a little bit like the Peace Corps. They go and work for this federal agency for four years and mm -hmm. then they're out. It's like a short term like mm -hmm. looking in. But they said you know people want to. 
do some good service in their life. So they may be willing to come, you know, if they're, if there's not, it's not always just about money. Obviously money matters, but sometimes there are other reasons that people will come and do if they feel like they can help out in some way, do some, feel good about what they're doing. Um, that is a piece of it also. Because that's a problem, I think, for every, every fiscal officer who's there is like, you know, who has the money to compete with California, right? Or, right. <laughs> right. And then, so that was a different workshop than the one, one that we thing went to. Went yes. to. Yeah, because did you go to the cybersecurity one? Is that what yeah, the yeah. task force, which yeah. I'm really happy that we yeah. went to that. Mm -hmm. so it was, good. It was a one-day effort, and they had a single program that they did uh, on Monday. It was about two hours or thereabouts. It, it was word for word identical. Oh, good. I'm glad I didn't stay. <laughs> <laughs> it was identical. <laughs> oh. Except the uh, the, uh, the uh, audio visual didn't work. Yeah. I mean, probably the biggest takeaway that I took from that task force was, you know, most legislatures are behind. Um, you know, this is really expensive, and you have to prioritize. So there you go. There we go. Everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so anyway, you have access to this, and I'm happy to get you hard copies if you want. Thank you. And then. Um, the other thing I want to talk I would, about. Uh, Catherine, if you can get hard copies, I would love a hard copy. Okay. We could, we'll of, just get. Of the rest of, of, of the, the Of that workbook? Yeah, absolutely. The handbook? I, I already have, I already asked for one. Okay. So you don't need to make a copy for me. Okay. It's already. And I'll, I'll look at it online. So. Yeah. I can't we'll look online. Don't. I like. I know. Uh -huh. <laughs> like a book. Well, so I can can't I, feel it online. Is that what you're saying, <laughs> Senator? I mean, can I, I can't other? feel it online, but I look can see this. <laughs> see right here. Uh, I can touch it. I can look at it. So, don't make me a copy. Is what I'm saying. I've already got one. And what, one of the other interesting things that he talked about was um, Waldo. Is his name Waldo and Robin? And Waldo was talking about in his presentation. You you know how we all have all these things that plug into the wall. The outlet mm -hmm. is a standardized thing. Really, you should be designing systems so that you can unplug pieces and plug in different pieces so that you're not locked into one person mm -hmm. who manages everything and it's a customized thing. Now, that doesn't always work because you had beta versus VHS, right, when you did the videos at first. But but the concept is that you really are, you need to control vendors and you need to make sure that they can make it accessible in a, in a timely way, which is, which is a good lesson for all of us as we've learned when it hasn't worked. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk to you about is integrated eligibility funding. And in the capital bill, uh, it, they, the integrated eligibility project is funded in installments. And uh, September 1st, AHS and ADS have to deliver a report. And then at the September Joint Fiscal Meeting, the Joint Fiscal Committee has to approve it, give them authority to have the next chunk of money. Um, Joint Fiscal is supposed to get recommendation from the Chair and Vice Chair of this committee, the Chairs of the Institutions Committees, and the Chair of the House Health Care and the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. Mm -hmm. And so we ha you're going to get the report September 1st, Joint Fiscal's meeting September 16th. There's not a lot of, um, it's a pretty short turnaround time. Dan Smith is going to, his plan is to turn around a, a, a memo, a recommendation. Yeah within a few days of getting the report. Um, so you all will have that in your hands for those of you who have to provide a recommendation and Joint Fiscal will have it also. Do you want to talk about what you were thinking for the yep. process? We, we talked about trying to get that to turn around pretty quickly, so getting the report, the recommendation, and then uh, having Becky draft um, a letter and then sending those three things out to the committee to see if there were additional edits or... And then that recommendation would go to go the to Joint, Joint Fiscal. Fiscal. So yep. Sometime before the 16th. Yeah. Yes. I may be incommunicado, so if you don't get a response from me, okay. just yes. that in mind. Winter. Sounds like you're incarcerated. <laughs> <laughs> Bolivia, is that it? <laughs> Bolivia? Yeah. Where? All over. Oh, God, I was in Bolivia. Oh. Well, we'll talk later. Yeah, we should. <laughs> oh. So this same thing, if this works, we'll probably have it. Well, it needs to happen again in November because you have the same process. So you, if this works, that's great. If it doesn't work and you want to have a different plan in October, November, I'm sorry, November, um, you will have because the Joint Fiscal will meet again in November and have to prove the next. Installment. So this report is supposed to be presented, uh, completed, and presented 
by I just want to get the date September oh, for se September 1st September 1st yeah all right so we're only days away from when that report is right. supposed yeah. to be right so I would assume mm -hmm. the update today it's going to be pretty much give us uh, right. uh, what would be in that report so that the timing is yeah. kind of helpful in terms of the quick turnaround I think the the only other alternative to the plan that we've kind of talked about in terms of that letter is if the committee wants to convene on the phone or in person, which I can we reserve the right if, yeah, sure. if the report is sort of yeah, shocking sure. in some or way. what we hear today yeah. somehow so yeah. that they're way over budget and way behind, then perhaps we would want to meet. Okay. All right. I think that's it for me. Do you have any questions? Anything? Okay. That's great. You ready? Sure. Wherever you'd like to sit. You've extended our cable to yes. anywhere you want. Now. Thanks. And I think we have your materials. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. okay. So, for the record, Cassandra Madison, Deputy Commissioner at DIVA and Program Sponsor for Integrated Eligibility and Enrollment. Um, so I'm here this morning to just Is that a new program sponsor? Yes. Oh, is that a new title? title? No. Oh, I'm sorry, say it again. She's program sponsor. Program sponsor, <laughs> business lead, person who cares the most about this thing. <laughs> is that an ADS term? Uh, it's a project management term. term. That I've heard. I would yeah. say. Uh -huh. Is that consistent for all of our IT projects? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, wanted to present an interim, interim update. You're right that we're going to have the written report ready for you on September 1st. So a lot of what you hear today will be reflected in that report, although there are some things that we're working on from an IT perspective that are kind of late breaking, which will be, uh, you know, need to be updated in the final report. I will say just uh, briefly touching on what Catherine said on 18F. Um, we, they are an advisor, as she said, to IE and E. We're working really closely with them. Basically, what they've laid out in that workbook is the heart and soul of what IE and E is trying to do. Um, and uh, some parts of it are harder than others. It's a, it's a large-scale transformation project. It's not just about delivering the technology. It's about changing the way we deliver technology. Um, and I'm sure that if, if you all were interested in hearing more from 18F directly, they would be happy to make a trip here and talk to you. So that's offers on the table if you, if you want more information about, about their work. Um, so um, the focus of this, I think we can look at, I just tried to make it really simple to look at our in-flight projects and understand their status. Um, so uh, if we, I know we only have 15 minutes, so I'm going to focus on the places where we have risks. Um, the places where we're doing well, you can see healthcare paper application, that project's in its phased rollout. Um, we've uh, met our first two CMS mitigation items, that's also in green on there, third from the bottom. Um, and the two new projects that we started, our online application and premium processing projects, have started off really well and we expect to have a vendor on the ground in September. Um, the places where we're having challenges, so business intelligence, this is our reporting and analytics projects. We talked about this last time we all met. Um, it's basically we're sunsetting the Vermont Health Connect standalone solution for reporting and analytics and moving to uh, SQL Server, which is a solution that is already owned and maintained by ADS staff. When we talked last time, we talked about state network issues that were preventing us from loading that database with with production data so that we could start testing and that really delayed this project by three and a half months. Those issues have since mostly been resolved and the data is in the database but as we started testing we're seeing that there's a lot more work that needs to be done on the database itself for it to be functional. So we've had to trigger a couple contingencies. Um, one is uh, to delay some critical Oracle upgrades that we were going to do in September of this year. We're delaying them until February so that we can maintain the existing <coughs> data warehouse for the next, through open enrollment so we don't pose any risk to open enrollment. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that as a contingency I did, last and time. we're triggering it. Okay. 
Um, we are also going moving to con actually contract out for 1095 and enrollment reporting instead of bringing it in house, um, because at this point we don't believe that the state staff are in a position to handle the complexity of that reporting. So for at least the next year, we're going to need to contract out for that. Why? And that's Why? Is the state? I think our. I think that um, the that reporting is very com complex and we want to narrow the focus of what the state staff are working on and have them focus on setting up the core warehouse and setting up operational reporting and not pose any threat to our ability to accurately produce 1095s and enrollment reporting for uh, to meet federal obligations. Is that your um, I have a similar question. Have we been, <clears throat> is this a process that's been in-house and we're going to start contracting or have we always had it We've handled always, by a contractor? We have always <clears throat> had it handled by okay. a contractor. This project was an attempt to bring it in-house right. as okay. a part of our overall reporting solution. And um, just given where we are, uh, we need to get this done by February. We need to get the core data warehouse built by February. That's a form people need for their tax. Yes. Uh, so that it's really important that we would hear the phones would yeah. ring yes. mm -hmm. the number one priority is to protect operations so so what we're trying to do is narrow the focus of what the state staff the ADS staff need to work on and we're focusing on them on finishing the build of the core data warehouse and getting just regular operational day-to-day -day reporting up and running 1095s and enrollment reporting to the federal government are very complex and so moving to contract that out, we feel like it's just safer. Let's not it's mess not with It's not moving, that. it's keeping it contracted. Yeah, but we're gonna like, we're Change looking at moving vendor? a different vendor. Yeah. And we're, yes. So not to get too no, far fine. off, and this is probably a John question, the network issue, the network delay was at a high level because of? Um, we don't know. Okay. Uh, we have uh, four different vendors working on it, including us. And, you know, we don't know that it's a network issue or a configu configuration issue with the system. Yeah. Um, but we have the vendor on site for that product. They're not seeing anything. We have network vendors here. We have C2 here. We have everyone looking at it. We're doing line captures from the network. So We're for those of us that aren't, yeah. like, um, mm -hmm. network engineers, how did that manifest? Like, what did that look like? Like, you weren't, we weren't able to move. It from was one place to another. Yeah, it was disconnecting partway through the move. So as we okay. move files, it disconnects and stops. Okay. And then we have to start. And that over. was a three and a half month problem. Yes. Okay. On and off. Okay. Um, which for for business intelligence is mostly addressed. We have the data in the warehouse now. Yeah. And it's it's replicating with reasonable speed, but now we are seeing a network issue in a new project our enterprise content management project, which is document imaging and scanning, is another project where we were sunsetting the standalone VHC solution and moving to OnBase, which is owned and maintained by the state. That project is green, green, green. Everything's looking good. We went to move the data, the files, into production three days ago, and it times out at 150 files, and we need to be able to move 10,000 a day. And so we're in the same situation where there's teams trying to figure out what the problem is, and we can't seem to figure out what the problem is. And so um, it's impacting Go Live for that project, and it's also impacting Go Live for the document uploader, um, which is because the document uploader, when people take pictures with their phone, it uploads to the <coughs> document imaging and scanning system. So if the document imaging and scanning system can't move the files, then neither can the document uploader. So we can't go statewide with that project without these issues being resolved. Okay. Um, so I think, I think Secretary Quinn is the best person to be able to explain what is happening on the tech side. I think on the business side, we are trying to figure out what our contingencies are. Like I said, we've set ourselves up in a, the, the value of doing smaller modular projects is that we are we have isolated risk. So we're going to be fine with open enrollment. There's no risk to the existing system today. What it does mean is more time and more money. 
as these projects get delayed. And at some point, we're going to have to have conversations like, at, at what point, like, can this be addressed? I don't know. It's a technical issue that Secretary Quinn really has to talk about. And if not, what are our other options for this, this capability? Okay. I don't want to take really much more yeah. of your time and ask any question, but I am going to ask one more question, which sure. is, and we can talk about this later, John, at the end of the meeting, mm -hmm. maybe more. But are we seeing that kind of a delay or a problem with any other IT projects in terms of? No. Okay. No, okay. not that I'm aware of. This is the, the one area that we're seeing, and that's the puzzling part. <coughs> okay. When we, okay. Look at, when we look at our network, it looks like traffic's flowing just fine. Okay. Um, and that's why we brought in so many vendors, is because we can't identify where the problem is. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. Are, are, are we going to have time with Secretary Quinn, or what? I mean, we have some, we have 15 minutes, and you know I don't know how long Secretary Quinn's available. I'm happy to stay right. past that. At the end, to just talk about where we're at. He's and he, I mean, he's with us for an hour and a half at the end of the meeting. But we have a presentation. So. Well, I, um, so is it appropriate to just ask questions now? I mean, it's sure. to me this is. I'm trying to get my head around sure. it, and Secretary. The, I don't know. It, it, you're always in such dangerous territory because somebody like me knows very little. But yeah. it, uh, you know, I sat through it with the uh, exchange, and it, these are the kinds of reports that just are sort of hard to digest. So, mm -hmm. so I remember from a couple of meetings ago learning about this data transfer, and and the. You know that's a big chunk of data moving through our network, and we were watching that, and and so I, I guess I don't understand how these how do these produce months of delay? Like like I, I download movies, you know. I mean, it's just like just so hard to, to so fathom Senator, what is going on. So what I would like to ask is if we can keep those types of questions towards the end so that we can stay so we can make sure that Cass has enough time to tell us what she needs to tell us that sounds more like an ADS kind of oversight a well, more general I, okay, ADS I, oversight I, I would I you agree I agree with that okay. um, so maybe. but it's not in the cyber security discussion so I mean it is to me it directly relates to the question we're about to be asked yep. which is how do we review the September 1 report yep. And so, I, I don't, as long as we get to have that discussion into the I mean, do you have a brief kind of answer on that, or is this, do you have an answer for that? Um, brief one? I'll, I'll try to make it brief. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, when the problem was identified, we, we immediately started working on it, but as I've testified before, our network was never documented as it was put together. You know, we don't know how things are connected. We have... VHC, which was put together without any real thought, based on you know the, the federal guidelines that we had to follow, and it's a complicated system. Mm -hmm. You know, we've we've had issues with uh, AHS systems overall because they're in very very poor condition, and so is the network. I mean, we took that over, and we've been working on it, but this is this is a long, complicated process. This isn't like you know. Um, changing a tire on a car. This isn't something that's easily repetitive. This is, you know, technology that's fairly complicated. I mean, we have four vendors on site trying, trying to help us with this issue. So it's not a skills um, issue with ADS necessarily because we have outside vendors. We have vendors outside of Vermont working on it. We have, you know, um, product owners working on it. When I say product owners, like the ECM, the, the Highland on-base contractor or um, company is looking at their logs and looking at the products. It, it's not a trivial situation. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not a for a lack of trying by any means or lack of, you know. Um, but are we are we talking about sort of wiring or or servers or the whole mix of it or you know? Can you can you just paint a picture other than this is old and we're trying to figure it out? Yeah, so um, we don't know whether it's the servers, the data center, or the you know packet transmission that's happening. So 
you know, we have stuff living in one data center that has to go to a different data center. So one of the things we're doing is moving it all to one data center to try to stop some of the network issues between or potential for that as a way to rule things out. Um, we've looked at the product, it looks configured correctly. Highland has, uh, which is the company for the enterprise content management, has looked at the configuration, said everything looks pretty good. You know, we don't understand why it's timing out at 150 files, which means it's not a firewall issue because some of the packets are getting through. Like, it's, you know, there, there's several areas that it could be, and I think that's why it takes so long. The other part I would say about this whole entire thing was, you know, when we talk about an agile process, you're not supposed to have a drop dead date at the end of it. It's supposed to be iterative. You're supposed to look at the problem, work the problem. And here, we're, you know, in this, you know, we call it an agile process, but it's only, you know, we're trying as state government to move to this agile process, but we still have those hard deadlines that we're trying to meet. And so every time we get close to one, it's, you know, uh-oh, we're, we're falling way behind, when really when you're doing an agile project and you're developing something for the first time like this, it's not supposed to be a drop-dead date. I will also say, so if we take a step back and just look at the approach that we're trying to take, user-centered design is working really well for us. Working in a more agile way is working really well for us. I think approaching things modularly and um, having smaller procurements is a really positive thing. It's like I said, even when we go into the red or the yellow on some of these projects, the, the ramifications of that are contained, right? It's not disrupting our operations the way it would have when we were working on Vermont Health Connect. So we have successfully reduced risk. The projects that are in green, and even to some extent the ones that are in yellow, are already making people's lives better. So for example, we know the document uploader is out there at, at at least several district offices and working with the sisters and people are really excited about it. I think where we have a challenge here is it seemed logical to take a technology that was already used and owned and maintained by the state and to expand the use of that technology. So in the case of OnBase and in the case of SQL Server, these are not new technologies to the state. We have state teams that use them. That's where all of our data is already for the other integrated eligibility programs. So there was logic in expanding that. Um, I don't know if there is something we could have done ahead of time to analyze our network capacity, for example, or our staffing capacity to make sure that we were equipped to expand it in the way we were trying to expand it. And maybe we couldn't. Maybe this is just part of the Agile process and we're going to find out about this stuff as we pick pieces and pieces of it apart. But I think that's what we're facing now, because the, the places where we're having problems are the places where we're trying to expand existing state technology. It's not the new stuff that we're trying to go out and procure. Okay. Well, I'm having a hard time sorting this all out, because you're talking about the AHS network not documented. Even the state's network is not documented. So it sounds like, in fact, inherent in this project is um, a need to examine or and start documenting and formalizing um, the, the network. So we're, in some ways, not only doing integrated eligibility, we're doing a lot of house uh, mm -hmm. keeping, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, it's hard to sort out how much of this is, uh, maybe this gets to um, Senator Pearson's question, we've got the work that's being done on the agency side. Then we have the um, the hardware and um, the, s the responsibility that floats into your shop, um, and they are interrelated. And obviously, um, Cassandra's efforts are very much contingent on how the ADS side works. If we look at the summary, um, for those of us who are trying to sort this out. Would you say your work from on your side is is pretty well ahead and that what we're really dealing with is a, um, a very complicated tech issue um, that um, needs to be solved? And are we going to end up with, um, with a network 
that is documented. Um, and I'm not sure what happens to the AHS network that mm -hmm. you're, is that gonna be subsumed? Is that gonna be replaced? Um, Cause that, that um, is more than Medicaid. It's mm -hmm. all, all uh, benefit programs. So could you just I, help un me understand um, how much of it is going to fall to you and we're going to hold your shop responsible mm -hmm. and how much it is because Cassandra's folks aren't getting the work uh, done. Um, well, I, right. so so I, I, can, I can take responsibility certainly for the, for the technical side of things, you know, being delayed and being behind. Uh -huh. um, this, this is a complicated project. You know, we're going to continue to see, um, in a, you know, this is just the way, you know, I, I see it future reports will have yellow areas and we may oh, even we, have we should areas, expect it I right know. you know I think with a project like this I mean look at look at Vermont Health Connect right I mean and then you step back and you look at the way we're doing it now in a modular way short you know small pieces of work developing as we go there's going to be slips in time I mean that's all part of the learning process of agile and in continuing to learn but the network piece we are doing that work but um, it affects our cybersecurity as well. When we see an issue, when we see, you know, it give us an address, we don't necessarily know where that address is at this time, right? So we're doing that work behind the scenes. And some of the money that you all um, appropriated to us for some of the network replacement is helping with that. Okay. Yeah. The uh, date that is on there for target delivery date, is that a date that has slipped from uh, its original uh, date because of the delays? The only one that has slipped at this point for sure is business intelligence. Something no. may happen today to, mm -hmm. to if, if the network issue gets cleared on enterprise content management today, our goal now is to be able to go live on the 29th and there are war rooms going on. Is that February? Uh, no, sorry. Oh. Um, for enterprise content mm -hmm. management and document uploader, those are the dates, those mm -hmm. are original targets. Okay. Um, we we would like to right now our next target is to try to go live with enterprise content management on the 29th of August if we can get these network issues cleared if that happens those projects both flip to green and we are fine if that doesn't happen we are likely to be in a position where they're not going to go live till after open enrollment because October 1st we have to have a code freeze and so it's either this stuff gets in in <coughs> September or it waits until end of January. Does that mean that business intelligence has to be cleared or only the other, the other two? Business intelligence will not be cleared uh, because yeah. the database still, it, the testing revealed issues with the mm -hmm. core data warehouse. So there's still work that needs to be done to build, finish building that core data warehouse mm -hmm. between now and February. So that won't go before February. What dependencies, if any, uh, are, are driven by business intelligence. In other words, if business intelligence is not completed, and if those network issues yeah. are not timely resolved, what's the net impact to the rest of the project, right. if any? So right now it's a cost issue because we're basically <coughs> maintaining two warehouses. We're continuing to maintain the Oracle one that exists today so that we can use it for day-to-day -day operations, and we're working on building this new one. So right now, like until February, we're just spending more money. When February comes, we're gonna have some really big decisions about, there's, an, there's Oracle upgrades that are set to happen in February that we delayed from September. And so when those Oracle go, upgrades go in, at this point we lose the existing data warehouse. So we have set a drop dead date for mm -hmm. ourselves in February that we need to contingency plan around now. And so, you know, there isn't really an option to push the Oracle upgrades out anymore. So we would either, we, if we don't think we can hit February, we either need to find a different data warehouse between now and February, or we need to pay to install the existing data warehouse in the new Oracle environment in February. So we are trying to work on some contingencies, but right now there's no operational impact, it's just financial. In terms of financial, though, the September 1 reports will drive, I'm, I'm assuming, JFO to fund additional amounts to continue the project. And if additional monies are needed by virtue of these contingencies, uh, does that impact JFO's decision at this point? 
I can't speak to what will impact JFO's decision. I can say that there are two places where there is a financial impact. The fact that the project is taking longer will mm -hmm. certainly impact the capital budget and what other projects we can start given the financial constraints we have. So it may, need, it may mean a later start to other projects because we're still trying to finish this out because we have <coughs> a strained dollar amount. The other place where the, the bigger impact here is in the operating budget mm -hmm. because the DIVA operating budget is where the funds are to continue to maintain the existing data warehouse. So that is Five, it's going to be three to five million dollars gross. Seventy-five percent of that is covered by the feds. Right now is is the hit to the operating budget. Three so to five million is the hit. Is gross, and then set, it's really twenty-five percent of that is what would hit the diva operating budget. I so that's a million an and a half. Bucks. That's an unexpected, right. unplanned for cost. Million yes. and a half. Yeah, because of the business intelligence delay. So, I I think that that's critical information. Um, in terms of what would be those potential collateral impacts yes. um, in, in the delay. Yeah. Um, and um, even though it's, and, and articulating the gross, but also what would be the general yeah. fund um, impact, whether it's capital bill or uh, yeah. um, your operating budget, to um, understand. I think um, Closing your eyes and hoping it will go well. We've tried that oh, in the yeah, past, and that's not. <laughs> that's definitely. So not I don't. I'm doing. not anxious to repeat that, and it's better to um, uh, take time than be rushed by artificial deadlines. But we need to, and and certainly, um, those deadlines are not set in stone, and obviously have to have some flexibility. But. Um, in terms of what would be the implication, what would be the revised time frame, yes. what would be the impact on other projects, and what would be um, the, the fiscal impact, I think uh, for me as a member of Joint Fiscal um, is kind of key information. Yes, and that's all, those are all the contingencies that we're working on now. Okay. I think um, you know, we've, we had contingencies, we've triggered a couple, now we're looking ahead at the next milestone and thinking about how do we protect ourselves if we can't hit the next milestone. So expect it, as much information as we have about that today in the September 1st report, and that information will continue to grow as we do additional planning over the next couple of months. So I want to be clear um, that we already have a $1.5 million Correct. impact. Yes. On, on the DIVA operating Be, budget. And that is because of the delay? The delay in the business intelligence project, okay. yes. Okay. And there are potential additional financial impacts? Mm -hmm. I'd like to understand that yes. a little bit so more. Yes, so I think um, on enterprise content management, if we have to maintain, so again, that was an Oracle solution that was supposed to sunset at the end of September. If we can't sunset that, mm -hmm. we will have to pay Optum to maintain that and host that mm -hmm. solution again through open enrollment. So there will be some financial impact to that as well. And we'll know that shortly. Yes. And your written report will have this information. It's hard to um, yes. hear it, retain it. Right. and So uh, what you're telling us today would be reflected in that report in terms of uh, it's sort of, uh, you know, if this does not occur, then the impacts are this, this is the price tag. Yes. I mean, that's really what I think. With um, as much clarity as we can give. Okay. I just, I, I think the important thing to know is this, that like this enterprise content management issue is about three and a half days old. So we, we, the information is changing every day. So as much as we have, we'll get in the September 1st report. If it makes sense to give you like a weekly report out <coughs> after that on some of these key issues, we're happy to do that as we have additional information. Okay. Um, I think, um, so one of the things I think is we want to make sure we have a, we schedule more time for you yeah. um, in September. Yeah, so that, makes that will definitely be happening. Yeah. Um, are there additional items that are important for this committee to know in advance of your September 1st report and our need to make a recommendation. Um, there's one other thing that I want to give you a heads up on are some conversations that we've had with our federal partners at CMS about our cost allocation, and this is going to be most impactful on the financial side. Um, they, we have had an agreed, so cost allocation is basically when you build a technology project, how do you spread the cost across all the programs that are going to benefit mm -hmm. from that piece of technology? So if you're just doing healthcare, the feds 
<coughs> fund it at roughly 90-10, 90% federal, 10% um, state dollars. Uh, with the introduction of integrated eligibility and all these other programs, we have to distribute some of the costs across other programs like LIHEAP and SNAP and TANF. Um, and the only other federal agency that helps reimburse is the Food Nutrition Services, which does it at a rate of 50-50. So the rest would all be on the state dime. GAs, it's, it's all, say, it's and all TANF is dime. already maxed out, and right. um, every in terms of the block grant, there's no matching. So. Um, yeah. So food stamps is the only one where they right, and we've you, had trouble pony up actually, fifty cents, they'll match it. Right, and we've had some trouble getting dr actually drawing down that money from FNS. So we've had a cost allocation with CMS that's been approved for the past year and a half. Um, that and our capital bill request was based on that cost allocation, that approved cost allocation, mm -hmm. and we've stayed within that budget. And that was ninety ten. Um, it, no, it roughly turns out to about. It's about 70, 30, or you know, uh, 68, okay. whatever, 34, um, when it's all said and done, but that's all accounted for. Um, about three weeks ago, we got on the phone with CMS and they told us they no longer like our cost allocation. And they've had a lot of turnover, and they are, the changes that they would like us to make to the cost allocation. It's to their advantage, I'm sure. Yes, would make it more expensive for the state for projects that include all of pro all of the programs. Mm -hmm. um, so our, gen our capital bill ask is, was 4.5 per year. It would roughly put us a little over six, which is a lot of money in the capital bill. We are making a counter proposal to CMS on cost allocation that we feel really we feel makes logical sense, and if they accept our counter proposal, we will be fine with the 4.5. If they do not accept our counter proposal, when we come to talk to you in September, we'll have more information, and we're just going to have to talk about what that means, and then there's going to be a decision. Like, are we going to continue? Does the state want to continue to put in the extra money to continue to move forward with the vision of integrated eligibility so that all of those customers have an integrated experience? Or are there places where, because there's not enough funding, you want to pull back and do just health care? So can you tell me what the difference in, um, so you're, when, tell me again, when you expect to hear back from them with I've, regard to whether or not they'll accept that proposal? I have been eagerly trying to schedule a meeting with them. I was just in, I just came back from a conference where that they were at and talked to them about it a little bit in person. So I am trying every week to get on the phone with them. Um, it's been hard to get a clear response, but we're aggressively trying to get on the phone with them. So when we think about the recommendation to join fiscal and in September. My goal is to have an answer for you by then, but of course I don't control their timeline. So I can all I can say is that we're doing our absolute best. I, I was, it seems I like, was a, it seems like yeah. a big change um, yes. that we're talking about. Yes. And so what is the difference between making that decision <clears throat> in September mm -hmm. um, when joint fiscal needs to make that, you know, we need to make that recommendation, or their next point, which is when? Is it November? November. 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 What is what will be the difference um, between September and November? I think November would made? be fine. I, I think like we have projects in flight that are already going. Okay. It's not going to impact any of these in flight projects. It's really about the next round of things that we're going to start up. So our next project that we're talking about starting up is what it was master data management in October. And quite honestly, until some of this stuff clears, I don't recommend that we pick up anything new. Um, and then after that, our next project doesn't really start until May of next year. It seems so we like have some time. Um, we are really getting into um, a policy and a, a fiscal issue, and um, and not a tech issue for cost uh, for cost allocation. And, and because then the question is, well, do you want to do a Medicaid only standalone right. healthcare right. Mm -hmm. and pick up all the ninety ten, or do you want to give Vermonters back what they've had? previously, and that is one application would provide um, the data to determine that you get your health care, you get your food stamps, you get your LIHEAP benefit, yeah. et cetera. And to me, then we have to, we yeah, have, as, policy. the, the policy mm -hmm. is, do we want to provide that level um, of uh, uh, integrated services really to, to Vermonters? 
and what that price tag would be. And I think that we, I, I think that even if CMS were to force us into this worst cost allocation, we can do the online application that is integrated for everyone. We can, we can achieve Vermonter going online and filling out an application for all programs. Making it any more integrated than that on the back end is what would be significantly more expensive. So I think that's where the choice comes in, is how much more do you want to do beyond that initial application experience? Because that initial application is likely to you know, create, you know, it's the economic services data is going to go into the access system, and the um, healthcare data is going to go into Vermont Health Connect or access, depending on the program, and the workers are still going to process things separately. So it's, it's not an end-to-end -end integrated experience. People would still get separate notices. But you could at least, we can at least for sure make sure that they fill out one online application and mm -hmm. that their information is routed to the right place. I think it's the question for the, for the committees are going to be what investments do you want to make on everything after that? Unless, again, I, I feel like my job is to, warn, is to bring risks forward, and yeah. so there is a possibility that we're going to be able to solve this, and by the less, next time we talk, it's not a problem. But I want to make sure that you understand that these conversations are happening, and I don't, I don't know what the outcome of it is going to be. Yeah. Just quickly, I, I want to say, obviously, we wish this was sort of more green and less red, but to me this seems like uh, uh, proof that this new approach is the smart one. Right? Right, we're we're right. not totally mm -hmm. dangling out there. Yeah. Um, my question though is about the Oracle uh, updates, and, and are, is, it, is it a case where Oracle insists on, because of security and other things, these updates, and that's where we get in trouble? Like there's no we're, are we trying to say to Oracle, can you just give us another six months on your old system because that would be, sounds like really a lot smoother? Is it is it a case of them putting pressure on us because they don't want to have sort of outdated stuff out there? Or how does that? I mean, um, from the business side, as I understand it, is a question of these things being out of support and you have yeah. to pay extra dollars to get support on outdated software. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there are also some like um, things on our security assessment, our POAM, for those of you who are familiar with that, that um, these Oracle upgrades that will resolve. Right. So there's That's some critical right. security reasons to move forward with it. But I will tell you, this is again one of the reasons why we're approaching IE in this way and why we want to move to modularity because on the Oracle side, it's like it's all or nothing. You have to upgrade everything right. and it takes a lot of time and money or you do nothing. Like you can't do anything piecemeal. So a lot of this, you know, to, to Secretary Quinn's point, these artificial deadlines are, are artifacts of this old monolith right. that we have. It's, okay. it's not yeah. about these new projects. It's like we're up against a wall with some of these support issues because it is one monolithic system that we have to update. Um, I'm going to try and wrap this yes. up after <laughs> Seth's question, and we can come back to your yeah, no, suggestion that maybe I'm we need to meet again. Yes. Same. Um, worst case, if we do need to decide between the four point whatever and the six point whatever, um, an important piece of information would be the opportunity cost. How much extra is the Oracle support going to cost us? What's the uh, extra labor um, for having for not having this stuff integrated in? Uh, state labor costs, and uh, third overall, what's the impact to the Vermonters, um, the the quality of service? Yes. Because um, it's not just a four point something versus six point something to say, right. there's other factors. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, I also just <coughs> know that our, our current Oracle contract expires, I think, on February 17th, so that's another, you know, what we can ask of Oracle to help us with is wrapped up in that contract. <coughs> Oracle, well. yeah. Oracle's not the, not the most friendly vendor to work with either, or the most forgiving by any means. Mm -hmm. So, well, you know, we did have a love affair with them for yeah, a while. It's, it's in our, <laughs> yeah, it's in our best interest to, to be on to the good side. And, and everyone, you know, everyone has their eye on the ball watching that date and working towards it, too. Okay. You know, we'll continue to bring in more and more network vendors until we have this fixed. We know those dates out there. Are, are gonna or worse are gonna Cisco? present you know some real problems if we get to them. What'd you say? Are they better or worse than Cisco? Oh, well, <laughs> Cass, I want to make sure. You, is there anything else that you want the committee to know I today? I, I think I. Okay, and so we'll eyes. we'll we will get that report from 
who is that report going to come from? It's going to come from yeah, you. Yeah, but it's, it's a Julia's yep. report. Yep. Yeah, great. Okay. Thank, okay, thank you. I think the fundamental question is, do we really have any option? We've got right. this old, uh, not really, not well functioning from on Health Connect. We're dealing with some delays. We know that we're probably going to have to have some. some uh, I love all this new terminology: war rooms, agility, in flight. You know. Uh, Sorry. I got a. I got a uh, uh, so, um, in, in some ways, I sort of feel like we know that we've got a, a system that, for and Randy, you understand it better because you really looked at you know how the Health Connect got created, and. Uh, and if we agree that we've got to replace it and we got to migrate from that, then I sort of like feel like well, we can't just say, well, we, we're not on track, we've got too much red, we're, we're going to stop. I think we've, got, we've really got to figure out um, uh, and understand what the delays will be and what the impact what the will, impacts be. will be. Because, right. And um, don't forget we have the CMS Medicaid mitigation plan, yeah. which is so, driving uh, delivery uh, uh, of a lot so of So part of me is saying, gee, this is all interesting. I want to know what the implications of this, but I, I sort of feel like um, um, our, our options are somewhat narrow. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hostage, I get it yeah. right. <laughs> so we're making progress out from under it, and it's just all right. It's a slog. In right. this modular approach, I mean, you saw a lot of green things on there. If we yeah. were following the monolithic Approach it probably all be stopped I'll to be some stuck. degree, right? Right. So yeah. we're making progress, and that's you know that's part of the reason for doing it this way. So yeah, um, we will have you back in September, sure. and <coughs> we will probably schedule an hour of time just yeah. to make yeah. sure that we're staying right with you. Thank on you this very journey. much. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, and so we thank you, uh, mm -hmm. Jeff uh, and Pat, for your patience. And Tanya, I see you're in the back. So we're just going to have to shift a little bit in terms of time, um, and we may be able to have you come back. We have someone from out of state that we have a hard stop. We have to um, move at 1045 to have them start testifying. So if we could have you folks come on up. Thanks. Mm -hmm. You all have these presentations in your packets, and you know, while they're getting ready, just pass out. This is the, uh, the ending presentation for today. And so ah. the and they're all online as well. Good morning. Good morning. I'm uh, Jeff Lower. I'm the uh, Chief Information Officer for the Judiciary. And I'm Patricia Gable. I'm the Vermont State Court Administrator. Uh, thanks for seeing us today. Uh, we're going to talk uh, mainly about uh, giving an update on our next generation case management system and also about uh, how we're working on cybersecurity for the judiciary. Uh, I included in the presentation some uh, slides about IT at the judiciary. Some of that might be reviewed, so we'll go through that quickly and stop us if you have questions. So uh, we, we always like to start with, with a slide that sort of talks about IT in Vermont state government and where we sit here. Uh, you know, the judicial branch, uh, uh, the court administrator uh, works for the Supreme Court, and we, uh, in research and information services, work for the court administrator's office. Uh, and you'll see we have colleagues both in the executive branch and the legislative branch who have similar functions that we work with. And uh, we have an IT team called RIS, or Research and Information Services. Uh, we have a help desk that we support the needs of the courts. You know, the court's operations are somewhat unique in state government, so our folks on our help desk know how courts work and know what kind of questions they get. Uh, they then interface with other parts of state government, including ADS, as needed. Uh, we also support systems. Uh, our main system is called the court case, case management system. Uh, we have a legacy system today that's, I think, about 28 years old uh, that's providing that function. We'll talk about how we're replacing that in a moment. We also do a lot of statistics, uh, business analysis, and forms. Uh, many uh, statistical requests, many media requests. Uh, we're very busy, seemingly very busy this summer uh, with, with information requests from the external world. Yeah. Meaning records. 
Yeah, so we're just, just so you, I don't know if other parts of government are experiencing this. Request we're, for information? We're experiencing an explosion of requests for information. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's uh, challenging. I don't think you're... Like public records requests? Yes. Oh. Public records requests, you know, formal, yeah. official, a data request from various organizations, um, state and national, wanting more information. Um, just media requests, a lot more media requests, people interested, again, in trying to analyze data. And as you know, Jeff will explain in a minute, our current case management system is really not, wasn't designed, it was really designed just to run cases. It wasn't really designed to provide reports. And so <coughs> that's one of the reasons we're working on the transformation. So and one, um, back in the cobwebs, seems like 4D actually helped do some funding of the case management system 27 years ago because That's of the child support right. um, mm -hmm. connection. possible. <laughs> um, but there's no 4D, there's no, there's no other funding source in the development of this much larger than in more the technical management of individual cases. This is all being funded with state dollars. Uh, uh, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as, uh, I don't know if it's in our slide. It, it's but not, but we can talk about it a little later uh, as to how yeah. we're funding our new case management system. Right. It's, uh, both, it's either general funds or our tech fund, which is a model. Yeah, and okay. The Are they, uh, well, I understand, yeah. but uh, yeah. it's not. there's no federal dollars involved. No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, just to follow up on the information requests, one of our challenges is we not only have to have the bandwidth to fulfill them, we have to make sure they comply with our rules for electronic access to case records or public access to case records. Uh, so there's vetting that has to happen, and then there's a can we do it uh, question. Are we allowed to do it? What parts are we allowed to do or not? So, uh, I guess you need legal uh, <laughs> expertise. <laughs> yes, we <laughs> do. The judiciary needs more legal expertise. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and this is a slide you may have seen before too, but uh, uh, we uh, are close partners with Agency of Digital Services. And uh, uh, although my terminology may differ from theirs, I always break that up into two pieces. Sort of the allocated per employee uh, uh, services that they provide us and the on-demand or more a la carte services they provide us. And we utilize both. Uh, one, one uh, item I have starred here is Office 365. Uh, and I have that starred because uh, one, one of our budget challenges right now is that uh, that moved from being allocated to being by demand. And our allocated services are basically a pass-through for the general fund. Uh, uh, when it moved to demand, uh, it's created a challenge that uh, our, our team's working with ADS on right now. But uh, it's something that uh, we'll probably be having to revisit later as well. And this, I uh, realize, is uh, not easy to read, but uh, this is a technology roadmap we did in 2015 uh, showing the breadth of uh, can, services. Can I just stop you for one second, Jeff? Yes. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So just to go back to the allocated mm -hmm. um, versus on-demand, when did that, did that change align with budget years uh, and budgets? We or? first uh, were made aware this spring this problem. So. Is it a problem but or just align with budget? It's a Sorry. budget gap because it wasn't built into either our BAA or our budget. So that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh. So it was an unexpected change. Okay. Well, and do you roughly how big is that? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. so. How big is that gap, roughly? Uh, I, I believe it's about a $400,000 gap for us. So alloc it moved from allocated to demand. Yes. And in doing that, I would think actually demand would be a more accurate uh, billing right. mechanism because it would be based on actual um, Yeah, the, the problem for us uh, became that uh, our, our allocated services are, are funded as a pass-through, right? So if we're like being charged $500,000, we, we get that pass-through. Uh, our demand services, we fund uh, through. So it's a matter of how the, yeah. how the, the money budget is yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. You'll, so you'll, you'll see us later. Save somebody over here. <laughs> yeah. I know which pocket. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh -huh. right. Uh -huh. So uh, 
Would this be what they would call a Gantt chart? A little bit. It's because it, you can't read it. It's, it's a mix, <laughs> but really what it's meant to show is, you know, we, we did this chart in 2015 <coughs> showing all the kinds of things we support. Uh, mm -hmm. But you'll see uh, moving to 2018, 2019, how our new case management system really takes a lot of these functions and consolidates it. So uh, we're, we're on track here, and I would anticipate in 2020 we'll refresh this roadmap uh, and uh, get another view for the next five years. The colors are beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So talk, talking about our case management system uh, project, uh, uh, which we call NGCMS, or Next Generation Case Management System. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the courts run on a system called VTADS uh, that is between 25 and 30 years old. Uh, the principal uh, resource that supports that just uh, passed its 30 year uh, anniversary with the judiciary. Uh, wow. And uh, <laughs> it served us really well and it's very customized. But it was developed uh, for our world 30 years ago where uh, we weren't interconnected very well and it's very county based. Uh, so even though we uh, have the same system in each county, they're a little different and the data sources are different. Uh, we've worked to overcome that over the years, uh, but uh, this, the system has really been an impediment for the courts moving forward. Uh, so in 2015, uh, we kicked off an initiative to replace that and, and went through a pretty extensive request for information, request for proposals, uh, lots of study, lots of looking at what other states doing. Lots of work with the legislature and the Joint Fiscal Office through that process and uh, selected a vendor uh, to implement our next generation case management system. Uh, one of the key drivers for that vendor selection was that we felt as a state and the legislature was certainly uh, advising us that as well, that Vermont could not be up front in this, that we needed to pick a system that was tried and proven in other states. Uh, that really limited our selection, but we uh, chose a vendor called Tyler Technology, uh, who's now in 14 states uh, statewide and in thousands of counties around uh, the country. Uh, and uh, Tyler is now working with us on uh, implementing the next generation case management system. If you look at the project timeline for this, uh, uh, we're really proud to say that the Judicial Bureau, uh, which is our statewide uh, bureau that does uh, traffic, municipal violations, uh, fishing, and wildlife, uh, that went live on Tyler Odyssey uh, June 3rd. Uh, so that was, we, as, as they talked about earlier, we broke up our project into uh, smaller deliverables uh, and started with our Judicial Bureau. So uh, that, that go live has been successful. Uh, it's, it's, it's really exciting to go through. You know, we've got a punch list of issues that have resolved that we're working through, uh, but we've got a team doing that and are moving forward. So uh, we're, we're happy that we've got the first piece of the system in place. Our next chunk of functionality is going to be trial courts, and we're implementing the trial courts for all the dockets regionally. Uh, so we're starting uh, with Wyndham, Orange, and Wyndham counties, or excuse me, Windsor, Orange, and Wyndham counties. Uh, someone has called that wow, and that sort of stuck. Uh, uh -huh. But uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're starting with that group uh, to implement our first trial courts. And we're and on two track. would be Barr. Yes, uh, <laughs> yes, we have chosen Barr, too, yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, we're, we're, we're on track for that as well. But uh, one thing we're working through right now is when to go live with that uh, first rollout. Uh, even though I would consider the Judicial Bureau a success, I think that uh, our schedule uh, really short-changed a few pieces, uh, mainly around training, user acceptance testing, and making sure that the technical infrastructure was frozen. I think that Tyler came in with really short time frames for their recommendations and all that, and we want to stretch those a little bit. Uh, so we're looking at doubling all those times to make sure that we put less stress on the user base as we go live. Uh, so I have a question mm -hmm. in that regard. Mm -hmm. would, would that um, have a, like a fiscal it, impact? It mainly doesn't. Uh, the Tyler contract is deliverables based, so they would get no, mon no different money. Uh, the only real fiscal impact is our staffing internally. Uh, but that's, you know, those staff but are really, to pay them anyway. They're committed for the project, and uh, moving deliverables around really doesn't uh, finish 
change the finish date of the project so I, at all. But I would say, um, you might recall that what we do is we have um, backup people coming in as we mm -hmm. put our operations people on the project. So mm -hmm. that one delay, it doesn't, um, it's not part of the capital bill, it comes out of our tech fund. It's a we have a small tech fund. Mm -hmm. um, but because we're deliverables based, uh, we're able, able to manage the budget issue much better. Yeah. So there's not going to be a staffing no, and there will be no additional requests uh, for funding okay. for the project. And, you know, we really want to do, do better. We think we did well for the Judicial Bureau. Yep. We really want to do better. I, could you um, just, I'm reconciling the dates here with mm -hmm. your comment. You mm -hmm. might be asking for more time. Yeah. What you have here reflects taking that more time in yeah, terms so of that I, I, I just wanted to so take I, that comment mm -hmm. and, and yeah. relate it to this document. As of today, uh, we have not had the project sponsor, uh, Pat, and the steering board ratify this decision to change the schedule. We're going to do that the first week in September. So is this so what the I, schedule change or the old yeah. schedule? So what I would anticipate for. is this is the wow roll up. Uh -huh. I put a little dotted line here saying that's probably going to move to February okay. of 2020. To begin. Uh, right. Okay. To be rolled out, to be done. Uh, so so I, I put this block in here to show where, okay, so where the we've got some arrow room. is yeah. uh, you can see that we've got ample spaces here that everything can shift a little bit without affecting that end date will everything shift we we think that we will shift a little bit for okay. the uh uh as in rutland bennington uh you know that if, if you think about the way the vendor wants to work they really want to get out of here right, right. and uh, i think we do too so I, I believe we'll be able to make up the time. Okay. And, and okay. just, uh, you said through our earlier discussion, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I just want to make sure I'm hearing this right. This is not a technical issue. This is really about making sure the training and the people who are using the new system have a little slower on-ramp, is that It right? is. It's, right? it's about taking the time to really get them uh, uh, better up to speed before we, we go live. That's you know the smart. the it's it's interesting the uh, judicial bureau uh, is unique in that it has a huge volume. Oh right? sure, it does. but it's also simple in that it doesn't have a lot of case types. Uh, as we get into uh, Windsor, Orange, and Wyndham, uh, the volume is much smaller, but they're doing a lot more things. Uh, so we we really want to make sure we give them the tools to do that successfully. Just a question regarding the e-filing mm -hmm. dates: uh, they all are essentially the same date as the project dates in each category, except when it comes to ro rollout number four, where it's a year later. Is that a typo? Uh, no, uh, winter 2020. So we, we plan on staggering the e-filing four to eight weeks after the go live. Well, this goes winter this, 2020 this here, to winter 2020. Yeah, so, so, so it's a, it's, it yeah. means December to uh, okay. January. So right. uh, I should uh, make that clear. Thank okay. you. And it might, it might be helpful um, just to mention, because I'm not sure everybody would understand how the court system is organized, the Judicial Bureau is a kind of a standalone court. Um, our Superior Court, which is a statewide court, is divided into five divisions. And so the trial court rollout, like regional rollout one, is going to be much more complex because we're dealing with different divisions and we're also dealing with different stakeholders with whom we interact. And so part of our planning, um, uh, uh, like yes, just yesterday I met with uh, Annie Noonan and Scott Woodward, who's our project manager, to start talking about what they're doing and what we're doing and how we're going to work together. And so adding a little more time there is not only helping us with testing and all the rest of it, but I think it's also giving us more time now that we've had some experience with our first rollout to get people So where together. is probate in this? Uh, they're part of the rollout. They're yeah. a, one of the five divisions. That's all. I just yeah. wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They'll be in each uh, regional rollout. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, and so I'm clear, an attorney that works across counties mm -hmm. will have a time when they're in the old system in one county and, and starting to learn the new system. They will, uh, depending on how their work breaks out. So. Okay. And a, an important thing there is it isn't just an attorney. Judges. Yeah. The whole yeah. student yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And that will, uh, I've often said when I've come to sort of talk about our project, the most vulnerable time for us as an organization is right now, which means that we will, as an organization, without a lot of additional resources, be running both on the old <coughs> system and on yeah. the new system. 
And because we're kind of leanly staffed, it, it's just very challenging. So for Jeff's shop, he's got technical people still carrying that old system, technical people starting to learn how to carry the new system, including a um, really a, a, a a more robust development of our um, help desk staff where people out in the courts will be calling on the help desk not just for gee my computer doesn't work today but really making sure that they understand how to work it. And, and does Tyler come with built-in support staff I mean or do we have temp come online to help with uh, that? so for the for the rollouts uh, Tyler uh, came with a tremendous amount of people uh, I think at the judicial bureau there was a one-to-one -one uh, uh, ratio. Right. So uh, they, they essentially what they do is they take people from their other projects around the country and they all descend on uh, the state that's going live. Uh, so they've been great there. Uh, for ongoing support, uh, they have a help desk as well. And all of our uh, calls and emails for support will be funneled through our help desk. And then if we need to escalate to Tyler, we will. Okay. All right. Uh, so next slide starts to talk about information security and I've tried to break this up into a couple of pieces uh, policies uh, training and then the cybersecurity spot uh, and on the policy side you know the judiciary has some legacy policies around uh, electronic communications and passwords and personal devices and mobile devices uh, you know they're 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 a little old right now, uh, but we've got them in place. Uh, what we would uh, like to do moving forward is take a combination of our policies and refer to the new state information security policy that Executive Branch and uh, Secretary Quinn's team is developing, and be able to reference that as we need to and put together our own set. That's what other state judiciaries have been done successfully, where we're not reinventing the whole wheel but we're just doing what we need to do to be uh, unique. Uh, I believe there's only a draft of that in place. Uh, I'm not sure when the, the final one will be done from the executive branch, but uh, we're, we're looking forward to be able to incorporate that uh, with our staff as we need it. On training, uh, similarly, we have leveraged what the executive branch uh, has to offer, and we had judiciary folks this spring go through securing the human. We had, I think, 83% uh, attended that class, so we're we're happy to be able to move forward that way. Then as we get into the cybersecurity spot, I think I mentioned during our last uh, meeting uh, that we, we do partner with ADS in some areas on this and then <coughs> are unique in other areas. And I tried to lay this out as to uh, who does what. Uh, our work with ADS, uh, they're providing us sort of network and perimeter security through their firewalls, uh, virtual private network, uh, certificates and internet border, border intrusion security. Uh, so they're able to do that. We also went through an effort uh, last year where we took our desktop environment and migrated it all into a managed environment that we work with ADS on. Uh, so as part of that, they're providing desktop and laptop security uh, through the local operating system with BitLocker, Windows Defender, and security patches. Judiciary also utilizes OneDrive and Outlook, which both have built-in encryption. And we have implemented multi-factor authentication. Uh, we had an old version of that before. Uh, we've gone with a new version with ADS uh, that essentially lets us secure people as they're off of the state network. Uh, and we utilize that uh, both uh, for Microsoft Office and OpenVPN to get to our network drives uh, remotely. It's been a very successful uh, implementation working with ADS. Then on the RIS side, uh, we're responsible uh, for our server operating systems uh, and making sure they're update with antivirus and security patching. Uh, we have 115 servers we host with ADS uh, at their tech vault site. Uh, but we're, they, they do the hosting, we do the operating system uh, management. And uh, we're working to improve some of our management tools on that. Uh, we also have uh, 60 servers out of that 115 that are just running this NGCMS, Tyler's Odyssey. Uh, and we're working with Tyler a lot to make sure that's secure. Uh, one, one of the interesting uh, parts about going with a tried and true vendor is their, their architecture is, is tried and true, but somewhat archaic in some spots. 
So we've really had to push on them to make sure we're implementing the right security items. And we've worked with the ADS information security team to make sure we're doing the right things there. Uh, that's going to be a continuing effort to make sure Tyler uh, uh, is providing us the right configurations to keep it uh, uh, safe. You know, we do have a public portal uh, and website uh, hosted that go through to the Tyler system, so there are special areas we need to, to focus on. What, you know, you read in the news lately about particularly cities, small cities that have had their data Ransom. ransomed mm -hmm. and, and um, I guess I'm curious if something like that happened, does Tyler hold liability or do we hold it, you know, how does that so, uh, the courts? So, our data is held uh, by the state of Vermont. So, uh, Tyler would not have liability uh, for that data, so we need to make sure that any tools they provide are, are secured through the firewalls. But we do, we have like a thousand page contract with Tyler, and they do have certain responsibilities in that contract relating to security issues that do relate back to Vermont laws regarding mm -hmm. consumers and, and the web. And one, one other thing I might add, and I might have said this the last time, because so many states use Tyler, my counterparts in other states and I are in a special user group. And we have been, um, in the last year, become much more active in um, trying to improve Tyler's performance, um, asking them to you know, continue to improve. And I think we hope that that will help balance the fact that they're kind of a monopoly in you know, for state judiciaries in the country. So these kinds of things, as you know, the, those attacks will get more sophisticated. Our responses will get more sophisticated. It's likely, you know, we'll be attacked all the time, and you, you'd like not to be attacked, but if you are attacked, then what's your response? And we realize that um, that's just going to be an ongoing and growing aspect of the work that we've got to do. Yeah, as, as Secretary Quinn has talked in earlier sessions, uh, we, we do, uh, like the other parts of state government, uh, get attacks. Uh, and we've had both phishing attacks and spear phishing attacks that mm. have uh, gone after specific people in the Supreme Court. So, uh, do, you have, um, do you have any notification protocols or procedures that you follow in those types of events that are established and set up? Uh, we work with the ADS uh, uh, Security Department. Uh, are you talking about notifications to external? So if, you, if there's a phishing or spear, are there people like who would you notify? How how would you notify them? I see Secretary Quinn yeah. has his hand up. Do you yeah. want me to defer yeah. to him? Uh, let me start and then throw it over to okay. John. So uh, uh, what has happened in practice is we are notified by ADS that they have uh, noticed, and uh, we then work tightly with our team to make sure it's resolved. Uh, we have not had any resulting uh, loss of data, uh, so uh, we have been fortunate to have caught things quickly. We have a uh, system set up where when we see emails come in, if there's a particular spear phishing type of email that gets delivered to us, um, we alert everyone on our email servers that, you know, we saw this, please don't click on the link. Um, if there is a breach or if there is some kind of um, attempt on our network or um, some, some kind of data loss, we follow Vermont state statutes and then notify the Attorney General's office. Okay. So they have uh, statutes pertaining to uh, notification of the public. Okay. Um, I'm reflecting back. I think um, Secretary Quinn referenced um, um, we have a few servers that are not part of the ADS network in the state. Mm -hmm. And you say you have 115 servers within the ADS network. Do you have anything out free floating that's yes, not part I'm, of the I'm ADS network talk about that, in the next that poses slide. risk? Yeah. Oh, oh, you're going to talk about it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, are you uh, okay, so? I, I'd just like a question mm -hmm. back on the, the notification system because we have a similar system in the legislative branch where we get an email that says, please don't look at that email that you just mm -hmm. got. And, and I guess my question maybe is for Secretary Quinn. That always strikes me. I, I sort of look at my email in a crudely chronologically. <laughs> so I would have approached the uh, scary email and Before the notice. maybe acted, maybe not, and then looked at the, and, and I guess I don't 
why wouldn't we, and is there not a way to suck that email back into the server? Sucking is that a, is that a, is that a, uh, a safety and a privacy issue? Or it just always seems sort of weak to me. Hey, we really hope you didn't open that email. <laughs> it's the, you know what I mean? So well, are we just not, yeah, we don't want to be set up that way? Or yeah, what? I think it's twofold. In, in some cases, we do pull the email back. In other yeah. cases, people have already clicked on it. We want to notify them and alert them, hey, don't. you know, don't. And if you did, here's the number to call. Yeah. You're not in trouble, just let us know. Yeah. Don't okay. open the attachment. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So if you already did. <laughs> Jeff and Pat, will it be possible for you to finish your presentation within the next five to six minutes? Mm -hmm. OK, great. Yes. Okay, so uh, 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 Senator, your question about other servers. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, five servers uh, that aren't hosted at Tech Vault by ADS. And uh, they're legacy servers that mainly run, we have a system called FTR, for the record, that does courtroom reporting mm -hmm. uh, that we've always supported. Uh, and uh, they're running that. Uh, they're also, we have two servers that uh, our developers use. Uh, those right now are in Right River Junction. Uh, we have an effort underway to uh, move those to Costello Courthouse to a, a better environment. We've been working with ADS uh, to look at that move. Uh, they've done some security scans, helped us with uh, improving those servers, and uh, we want to spend the time to re-architect those uh, to be more secure. So there are a few outliers uh, as well. I should have just read ahead. Uh, quickly, uh, Focus, I know uh, uh, this committee has talked in the past about websites. Uh, uh, the vermontjudiciary.org website is hosted on Amazon Web Services Government Cloud. Uh, it's running uh, Drupal. Uh, we have a vendor in Maine, Portland Webworks. Uh, we have gone through an RFP process for that hosting uh, that uh, does all the work to keep that up to date and secure. Uh, it's notable that that is really an informational website. It's not holding any uh, uh, private data, so uh, uh, this, the, okay. the risk is, is minimal. It also doesn't have any direct <coughs> connections back into our network. Uh, but nonetheless, it is uh, uh, we do the work to make sure it's secure. Uh, we also utilize VIC uh, for some legacy solutions. Uh, VIC is largely being replaced by our NGCMS project. Uh, the Judicial Bureau part of VIC has already been replaced by NGCMS. But uh, we've got Vermont Courts Online, uh, some criminal division payments, and attorney licensing still on VIX. So. And uh, just to real quickly talk about next steps, uh, it's become clear to us that uh, judiciary staff alone uh, and our partnership with ADS isn't enough here. Uh, so we're working to establish a relationship with an external cybersecurity partner. The first step of that will be an assessment, a risk assessment uh, that we're going to do to see how we're doing and what gaps we have and really uh, come up with essentially the next 10 steps to improve our security posture. Uh, so is this, uh, uh, is this partner one that specialize, specializes yes, in judiciary? Uh, yes. We're not naming them because the contract's not done. Uh, uh, but uh, we're now talking to a partner who's worked for the state. Uh, they've worked Secretary of State's office. Uh, they've worked with the Department of Tax uh, and Health Connect, as well as a lot of other states. So uh, there, there would be someone specifically bringing this uh, to the table here. Uh, we're also uh, working, and Pat can talk more about an MOU uh, between the judiciary and ADS, so uh, we can smooth our collaboration in this area. Yes, and all I would say, because I know you're so short of time, is that um, Secretary Quinn and I met with our respective counsel, and um, we're working on an MOU that will supplement existing service level agreement to um, account for the fact we're a separate branch of government, but we're part of an enterprise technology solution, and um, so how we would work with that. And so, I Pat, you and I spoke briefly about that, and I think in the future, um, when that agreement is worked out, we would yeah. love to have a presentation. I'm, I'm really interested in how the branches of government are collaborating around these issues. So, mm -hmm. when you and Kenny will have that, yeah, we're happy to, to talk about that. I, I also am working uh, uh, closely with Maine and New Hampshire judiciary uh, CIOs, uh, and we're actually going to have a meeting. Uh, early fall to talk about not only what we're doing in our in our branches but how they work with their executive branch because uh, 
uh, Maine especially has a similar relationship uh, and uh, working a little bit differently so we want to learn from each other. Uh, we also see that as an opportunity to share resources to scan uh, and do some risk assessment across these three states. Are they Tyler <coughs> yes. states as yeah. well? Great. So that's what we had. Uh, uh, thank you for the time. Do you have questions? So the takeaway is that it's moving well. Um, you just want more time, not because of technology, but for training and to um, make a more reasonable implementation uh, time frame. For NGCMS, and, correct. And, yes. um, and the money, except for some little things that you talked about, is pretty uh, on target. So mm -hmm. we should say, leave here saying things are going satisfactory. Things are, are in our uh, view, satisfactory. Uh, NGCMS. Uh, cybersecurity will always be a work in oh, progress. Sure. Uh, so uh, I will never pretend that we're on track or done in that topic. We're always going to have to be getting better. Um, it, the, is it important that the systems that contain sensitive information are publicly accessible, uh, internet connected, or would it make sense to have a private WAN for the court system that's air gapped from the public uh, just for that? Additional layer. Uh, so, uh, sort of yes to both those. Uh, we, the public portal that's part of our NGCMS, uh, uh, has limited information about cases. Uh, it follows our court rules and uh, will have a gap uh, between it and uh, the core case management data. Okay. And maybe one parting thought I would leave with you. We, we've always been, along with the rest of the government, really part of open, accessible, accountable, <coughs> and transparent. Um, recent trends with the weaponi weaponization of personal information and data has really had me pause about that and think about you know, the policies we've always taken for granted. Um, so I don't have anything more to put on the table except it feels like that's not a just a little glitch or a bump in the road. It feels like that there may be the need to sort of step back and maybe have a little quiet group that takes a look at our how we're doing that right now and thinks about information and data slightly differently. It's really important that we report data that shows accountability and transparency and in the judiciary that people understand why cases are decided, people have to have enough information. At the same time, we don't want the experience of exposing people's personal information to be so broad now that they stop coming to the judiciary to have their cases decided. Right. So that's, you know, just a, a thought. One of the things that I notice a lot in doing record searches, searches for information across states, is that the states are very, very different in terms of the court information that's available. If you go to Florida, for example, and you pick a particular county, uh, you can do a search for name of any individual who's been involved in any kind of litigation and in effect bring up that case and the case results and indeed the documents that go to that case. In Vermont it's virtually impossible to find anything and in fact it's even difficult when you go to the courthouse and ask for records to be able to get records. How, how do we, is, is, as you look particularly uh, working with other states and how they do things, on the one hand, I get the sense that Vermont almost treats record information from the courts as if it was the court's information rather than the public's information. Other states deal with it very, very differently in which it's considered a public record that the public has a right to deal with. So, so our records laws, um, our rules, because yeah. we have court rules right. on that, actually are, um, with the exception of legislative policy, are very open. And so um, legislative policy has certain uh, divisions that cannot be online. Mm -hmm. um, but our public records laws are, are, and rules are pretty similar to other states. Florida is known as a huge outlier. There are a couple of, like maybe one or two other states like California, Florida. California, for example, very similar. Right, where personal information is not protected at all. Mm -hmm. Other states are much more conservative than Vermont and really protect personal information, which I, again, I want to distinguish from data, <laughs> you know, but things where you can actually look in people's personal lives and they restrict it more. And so Vermont just went through a rewrite of the access to public records laws because 
we now, now that we're online and not on paper, uh, it's changed uh, quite um, dramatically in terms of people's ability to access. So one of the issues you would find in trying to get court records is we're not online right now. Mm -hmm. But as court records go online, it will become easier technically to access them. And then the question is, what is the state's policy and what is the court's policy about what should and shouldn't be accessed? And we're actually in the Conference of State Court Administrators, we're actually looking at those issues right now. You know, do the states overall want to have a policy or is it so unique to states that we can't do that? So we'll be able to report more about that in the coming Well, that's really what I was yeah. getting at with, yeah. with, with the comment, is that yeah. once we go to what essentially is an online system in which the information is there as to whether or not it will be available to the public, will the public, for example, be able to go into the court record system and say, give me all the cases in which John Smith has been involved and show me where they are and then indeed go to the extent of being able to provide documents associated with that case. The same kind of information that might be present if you were to go to the courtroom and sit there and listen mm -hmm. to the record. Mm -hmm. So right, right now the, the legislature has adopted policies that mean data mining companies mm -hmm. could not just do that. And so the real pressure that's on states right now is that data mining companies who take this public information and they turn it into money. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, we do not make a information available that way right now. And so there will be certain things that one could do. Um, well, let's use civil because the legislature has not protected the civil docket for electronic mm -hmm. uh, access. So there will be access to certain information on civil cases. But even in, in other kinds of cases, people can go to the courthouse mm -hmm. and get on a portal and get that information. What we don't do is we are not designed either, unlike some states who make money by selling to data mining companies, up to this point we have not considered what? ourselves in, yes, they yeah. do. Um, <laughs> that's a revenue source for them. The courts do that? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but in other states, that information is publicly available without charge. Mm -hmm. Yes, some, so you've got the, it's all over the map, yeah. is what I would so, say. Can, I'm can I give a quick example yeah. too, though, uh, Senator? So uh, we, we talk with the people in Maryland often. In Maryland, uh, uh, for a long time has had criminal case information openly available on the internet. Uh, uh, we, as Pat said, it's only available by going to the courthouse purposely. Uh, in Maryland, uh, uh, many data aggregators have taken that information and created their own databases mm -hmm. of criminal mm -hmm. cases. Uh, Maryland, like Vermont, is very active in expungement, right? what should be expunged, what shouldn't. So their challenge right now in that as they're expunging cases in the courts, other people have copies of this. The, the, the courts have no authority to have them get rid of it. So it's created a, a real challenge for them and they're talking about backing down on all of that public access to criminal records because of this. So it's a very active topic amongst the courts and very important. Yeah, so all that to say, if the legislature decides to have a little uh, thought group about that, I'd love to be part of it. <laughs> okay. And I think we would like to yeah. just continue this uh, conversation with you all as you're thinking about it as well. Thank, thank, you. thank you for your flexibility you. and your report. Thank you. uh, Tanya, thank you for your flexibility as well. And I am... I'm hoping that we can get you to I think I go to about 30 minutes. Yeah, We've given you about an hour. Okay, great. I'm Tanya Marshall. I'm the Chief Records Officer and the State Archivist for the State of Vermont and the Director of the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. I'm probably the only person in statute that has three titles. Um, <laughs> 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 Um, I'm going to talk to more on information and governance, and I just do a little overlap on the cybersecurity because all the conversation that nationally just ended with the judiciary is really about the larger picture, and that's the role that the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration plays. Um, just for background, um, there is a statute, the Statewide Records and Information Management Program, and that is done by the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. We are in the Secretary of State's office. Uh, we're charged with administering it for all public agencies, so it goes across all different branches. It goes on local government as well. 
um, to really espouse the industry standards in terms of generally accepted record keeping principles. So if you're familiar with general accepted accounting principles, there are some for record keeping as well. Um, industry standards across the board um, and best practices and um, our, our citation is in Title III, um, 117. Uh, the specifics within that mandate that we have is to provide assistance to public agencies in creating the records and information management program and we're format independent. So all the policies that come out of that, which I'll talk in terms of governance, are format independent. Um, it breaks down everything from the people involved to the processes involved and then the infrastructure that supports the management of information. Um, our other charge is related to having and in, in ensuring that there is repositories across the state that can effectively manage um, each public agency's records and information regardless of format and that they're operated in compliance with the law, the standards, as well as the Public Records Act. Um, so the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration actually administers three enterprise-wide repositories right now. We operate the Record Center, which is used by all three branches of state government. <coughs> we operate the State Archives, physical state archives, which is used by all three branches of state government. And we also do a digital archives, um, and, and, so, um, and that is currently government and then parts of local government. Um, when an agency's day-to-day -day operations around a record that has continuing value or a piece of information that has continuing value subsides so that they, they can continue with their regular work, they can transfer legal custody of those documents and that record and information to the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. The Secretary of State's office becomes the legal custodian. Are there any um, agencies, branches, entities of state government that you are not the <coughs> receiver of their records or that we're working no we okay. have um, so within the state archives we have all three branches including the legislature um, <coughs> for each biennium all committee records legislative audio everything comes into the state archives and records administration we are the we're the custodian after that point and the legislature is able to move on to the next session uh, we are sessioning on different records from the courts and there's a process that that happens um, and it's about two or three percent of all records graded across the board are archival and would meet this criteria of being legally transferred. We also are the holder, which means we are not the custod legal custodian, but we, when we have a state record center, that's um, in terms of paper records, in, uh, agencies and permits will transfer into the state record center. We manage them in accordance with the records management processes and procedures that, that have been uniformly developed. And then the records are disposed when they're legally required to go. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in terms of the three that we operate, um, the other ones would be operated by um, Agency of Digital Services or they could be within their own branches. Like your case management system, legislative systems would be, you know, it's not necessarily enterprise wide, but it's still within your own branch. Um, and then our last charge, and there's a couple more related to this, but um, for this context is information management standards. Um, we have done a number of those over the years, um, have been in coll collaboration with um, Department of Information Innovation when they existed, and then information governance frameworks, which is what we're really gonna talk about today within the context of what we look at when we're looking at protection of records and information across the state and how well agencies and departments and branches are able to do that. Um, so what is information governance? There's a number of different um, definitions, but the end is really about managing your records and information, and that's inclusive of data, so it's regardless of format, in a disciplined and coordinated and a measurable manner. So do we know are we being effective with it? It's a combination of people, processes, and infrastructure, which is nothing new. Um, I know the focus of cybersecurity, so I always like to go back to what the definition is. So cybersecurity is really focused on electronic and internet and computer, so to speak, um, at the end of the day, though, we want all our public records to be effectively Secure. protected. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the statewide records and information management program, we are not format specific. We, we cover all formats. So that's just the big difference between cybersecurity and, and what we would say as protection as a whole. Of course, we're looking at electronic records and ensure, wanting to ensure that those are protected, but paper records have the same kind of risk. Um, other kind of formats, whether it's logs or other forms of data that even are something that someone can read are at equal risk too. Um, so we really cover the whole part of it okay. um, in terms of scope. Um, when we look at people, processes, and infrastructure, um, these probably look like the classic service domains or the business domains of archi business architecture, information data architecture, application technology, strategy. Um, when we put on the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration hat and looking at it in terms of legal requirements, the strategy is really what the legislature enacts. 
your goal is to try to provide services to citizens through legislation and then it's the public agencies that are responsible for figuring out how to apply that and how what is the most critical needs that they have and that comes into why we receive or create information and then we're looking for applications to really service that and we're looking for the technology to support it um, so that's that's really the goal within um, within the, that program. So what we've implemented over the last couple of years is there's a standard to say maturity model. Like where are we? And we can do this at a small level with a particular office or a division. We can do this with the agencies. We've worked with the Agency of Human Services that actually is working through um, a large scale kind of overhaul of their records and information management right now based on the information governance maturity model. Um, so it's three levels, very basic. Um, it's used at the corporate sector as well as the public and private sector. Um, level one is basically saying that things are kind of ad hoc across the board when you're talking about business, when you talk about people understanding the information and, and records that they receive, um, if there are policies, procedures, infrastructure, technology, ad hoc, kind of working in some areas, not always. Um, level one is really substandard. Um, development, more awareness. Level three is basically the essentials are being met at all levels. Um, level four is really being able to integrate into operations so we're maximizing our information because the reason we create and receive all this is to make good decisions, mm -hmm. right? And, and provide the services that we need to provide. So our goal as a state and any entity is always to be a transformational, that we're really having the right information at the right time given to the right people, which is at the same time as making sure the information that we don't want to the wrong people is occurring. But we also want accurate and reliable information. So each of these can be measured at different levels, um, and it can be done at a technology level, it can be done as a business process level, it can be done as a record keeping level. Um, and so we have been working with the agencies and departments on having them walk through an assessment of what that looks like. So I'm gonna, I wanna ask you a question. Mm -hmm. So how does an agency experience uh, you working with them on information governance and ADS? Um, like how do those things kind of how do they work together? Yeah. I mean, the Agency of Human Services is probably the best example. When we work with an agency, we require four disciplines to be around the table at all times, and that includes information technology, business um, operations, the records and information management, which tends to be our staff mentoring an individual within the staff of the agency because most agencies don't have records and information managers as a full-time position. Or, um, and then the last is legal. So in terms of like ADS collaboration, those agencies already have representation from whoever has been assigned to be the liaison for the technology piece. Okay. Yeah. Uh, success rate, just to let you know if those four disciplines aren't around the same table and working together, it's the same as that architecture model they just said here. If you don't have those together, you're not gonna see success because you're gonna end up with more risks. Um, so I'm just going to walk through these. These are the generally accepted record keeping principles and I actually like what Pat had just said because she said transparency, accountability, um, you know, all those, all those buzzwords, that's actually what record keeping requirements um, are. So um, they walk through, it, it's independent in terms of format. Um, each principle though is as important as the other. So if you're picturing building something like a platform, if you have one pillar that's much higher than the other, it's an unstable environment. Or if something's shorter but looks, you know that it's gonna start falling apart at some point because it's not stable. Um, these equally have to be there for a functioning governance component and to be have very successful in terms of managing records and information across the board. Um, accountability, so, yep. so, you know, where we ended, are you getting to the place where we ended with um, Pat? Yeah, it's kind of, it was a nice segue. Yeah, okay. okay. I'm just interested if you, you know, if you, if you would have, you know, said, well, here's what yeah. we could do, or here's what we're thinking. And, and yeah, and we actually have an active collaboration with the judiciary as well, okay. and one of our staff members. So okay. yeah, accountability is, a, is the biggest thing, is having, you know, um, ironically, most agencies and departments actually fall at a sub-level on this one, which means that there isn't one particular person <coughs> who is, familiar with the records and information of that agency or department across the board and is at a high enough level to really m motivate change. Um, so that's kind of a key thing and it can't be sit with somebody who's just there to move, but it really having that, that, um, that background. Um, my, my background, just for context, is information science. So I disciplined in all four areas, had you know extensive kind of education and training. 
Um, that's the ideal because you do want someone who understands the technology piece of it as well as the business operations um, as well as the information management needs and the legal because that's where a compliance level comes through. So when we do an assessment and walk through with the agencies, we really ask them where, you know, where are you on this? And this is the one that is the most highly recognized of not having that particular, even an FTE. I'm just trying to see how technology is influencing. I'm, I'm back years ago, for example, with um, child welfare cases mm -hmm. or public assistance yep. cases. After three years, they'd yeah. be sent to public record <laughs> and of course they were confidential right. um, now we have a kind of a combination of paper and um, yes. a, a lot of um, a lot of it is online right in a database mm -hmm. how do you reconcile what's I mean and then there was a obviously you had a after a period of X number of years right. those records were disposed right. how do you reconcile if you've got both paper and you've got um, digital or are you making everything digital now? No, um, so it's not so much on the format, but we're really starting with um, the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, just to back up a little bit, was created in 2008 by the legislature and part of it was to dissolve um, what was the Public Records Division um, underneath Buildings and General Services. So up until that point, um, records management was really just about assigning retention period and then mm -hmm. disposing it in very right. paper-based. Uh, there was a Public Records Advisory Board that was a point tease. Um, none of the individuals on the board were actually had a background in records and information management, and so when we took well, the over, less you know, the easier it is. <laughs> <laughs> but it also meant that we were making a lot of decisions on records that were not great. Um, so sometimes holding records too long, which I'll show here, is a is a risk. Um, so. All the policies now, they have to run through a record schedule, which is the life cycle management. Mm -hmm. And then whether it's paper or you know electronic, the life cycle is still the same responsibilities. The accountability is still there. The response, the uh, management controls are still there. They're just a little bit different if they're paper-based versus electronic. But you'd expect these things to execute because it is, it is, it, 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 if you if you have a retention for three years of something, does it matter if it's it's electronic or paper, it, it doesn't. You just have to be in the right repository to make sure that that can execute correctly. Um, so we don't do anything format. When we write the policies and we do a collaboration with the agency's department that set the management plan, also set the retention and disposition, which are two of the principles here, um, that's the high level policy of accountability of what's expected in terms of life cycle management of that information. The next layer down is, okay, from an operations standpoint, how is this going to Can you occur? actually delete or dispose of digital information? Um, with a paper record, right. you can shred it. Yeah, but that's electronic I, It seems like things. Ollie North discovered that in fact, <laughs> that record's out there so somewhere. Nice. Well, and when, so, we get, when we get into- So I'm just wondering how you deal with there, it. There is, and that's where our collaboration is with you oh. know ADS on if they stand up the systems. The digital archives, obviously, we don't want to destroy anything out of that because those are records that are expected to come in and right. be permanently preserved. Um, but we electronic records management systems exist, and they do. They, they run through a per cycle, and then there's a different, depending on the system, and how the infrastructure has been set up, I always worry, because we do know this within the state of Vermont, you know, it can look and feel like it's been destroyed, but the agency is not aware that it's still sitting on another server, maybe as a backup or some other thing in the past, right. mm -hmm. right. and now responding to public records requests and stating, because from the business operation, they believe that it has been deleted, or discovery requests, that happens more often than not. But if we are in a good state, and at least being at, say, level three, which is essential in terms of governance, that likelihood should be less because everyone knows where their information is actually stored and, and happening. They don't need to know the details of how it's been working behind the scenes, but at a very high level, we need to know where our information is stored um, because that becomes a risk on the cybersecurity part. If we don't know where to protect, and we don't know <laughs> what we're protecting at a certain level, and it's a little ad hoc, that's where we at, end up not only risk on having information get out that we do not want to be accessible to other individuals, but we also end up with risk from a management perspective of you know, falling into a quagmire with legal discovery, public records requests. We also end up paying a whole lot of money to store things that maybe we didn't need to do. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a collaboration component, but it is based on the statewide records and information management. Uh, program and so if we really just walk through the agency starting from a policy 
to an implementation, then to a decision making of what those applications really need to be, and then what kind of platform, and then they work with their partners, which include agency and digital services, as well as any other vendor mm -hmm. to really execute that. Uh, transparency, um, this is really getting into the documentation. Um, we always use transparency in government about, but it's transparency of also knowing what we're managing and why we're doing that and which level everyone is in terms of business processes being documented as well as the records and information management processes. Um, it's a key part. Obviously, we want our software and our applications to match the requirements that we're trying to meet. So having that transparency is where an agency feels confident to be able to say, I feel that we're effective in managing these child welfare cases, and here's the system documentation about where those records go in the life cycle and what happens to them so it's not just, you know, someone's own memory or, or, or um, it's kind of ad hoc. We don't want the ad hoc approach um, to that. So system documentation as well as process documentation. Uh, integrity, the key part is we want, we want, we want good information. <laughs> we want things that are uh, reliable and authentic. Um, best example of this where we have that is like when you have an electronic version too, of not knowing which version it is, and we have, you know, just from a business process standpoint, when you have an agency that might be scrambling to figure out if they have the latest copy or the individual, that's where this is, we end up finding the integrity is pretty low. So there may be one that is the final draft that everyone wants to share, but the way that's being managed or whatever the business process is, we have to expend some more time to try to find that. That's when we get concerned about integrity. So when we look at that maturity model and we ask the agencies, give us an example or an office, this is where we're able to rate where they are. Does that help? Yeah, I'm thinking about the uh, video that uh, Secretary of State posted uh, a couple of days ago, the deep fake video, and thinking about this integrity. And if you are doing any thinking about With the, the integrity of records and deep fakes and that sort of thing. Right, so in, in terms of, I'm not really sure what video they posted the, the other day. Uh, <laughs> was it on their Twitter account? Yeah, it was um, one showing uh, this, I can't remember his name. Really to the elections component. Turning, um, no, turning into Tom Cruise. I mean, it was a deep fake. Oh. oh. My goal as an you know, information <laughs> professional is um, when that life cycle is not working the way that it is in terms of either business process operations or you know even electronic and the applications aren't supporting integrity ends up being um, very difficult for an agency to say I have the best information I have the right information and I have that so so I, I actually am noticing the time but I am actually pretty curious about this and Secretary Quinn um, you know I, maybe I will ask you as well who is responsible for, um, like, who would we turn to that could confirm the, you know, that this is an actual record? You know, like, this is, do you know what I'm talking about in terms of the deep fake? Um, <laughs> I can, I can see our, our guests, well, is maybe, maybe it's something we can talk about later, but it's yeah. something I'm definitely interested in the future. How do we, um, well, so are you looking at that someone has falsified, like, basically has corrupted information? Yeah. yeah. So the integrity piece, there's two different checks. Like even in one of the things that we've been watching, um, Secretary of State's office authenticates documents, uh, okay. which means we're responsible okay. for authenticating that something has actually, is what it purports to be. Um, in an in a actual technical world, that's easier and better to do than it is in the paper world. It, it's ironic, but you know, paper processes for that. So I think what, you know, if I was looking at, you know, what from a technical standpoint, you can say, oh, they, that was there and it hasn't changed, depending on the system and what's capable. Um, but it's still, when this comes to integrity, it also talks about, um, we get to protection after this, but it okay. talks about the fact that we may not have the most, the best yeah. information, and or we might be able to. We may need to have you come back on all of that. I'm, <laughs> I'm taking up some of your time, um, which we've already. No, ask as many questions. I mean, I live and breathe this every day. Um, protection. So this is really where you get into your, your area of security on that. Um, you know, for the, for the principle here, it's, it's about what's reasonable and suitable. Um, so the sense is that, you know, if there's something that an agency is publishing out and wants to be there, obviously we don't want people to be able to change the content, that's the integrity issue of it, 
um, but we're not as worried about it getting into the hand because we do want that publicly out there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about suitable and uh, reasonable guarantee. Um, and there's a number of different things. And when you think about people and processes and infrastructure, one of the greatest risks on the protection standpoint isn't always just the technology, it's about the people. We all, you know, we're in Vermont, we want to be friendly want to help people out, oftentimes it's the security issue ends up being more on an individual, per se, than necessarily it was technology. Mm -hmm. um, but this is really about having an agency assess. Um, so where are they? Do they feel like there's a lot of emphasis on information security, that they feel that it's across the board no matter what the format of the record is? Um, do they know that? Can they audit it? Is it continuously looked at and improved then at all levels? Um, or is it kind of maybe it's really good here but not so good there? Maybe we have the best kind of network for that electronic information, but the paper information is going out the door. Um, we look at it holistically, but that's the protection category. Do you have a schedule? Like, have we mandated that you go in and work with agencies and entities, or are they inviting you in on this? Like, how oh, is that happening? So Title I um, in the Public Records Act, it, it does require all eight public agencies to manage their records um, in accordance with um, standards that are provided by the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. It also states that they cannot destroy a record without yeah. authority, um, which is a throwback from a 1937 law, but we've continued it. Um, there was more emphasis um, in the past session with a um, revision to the law to try to, to make sure that there's collaboration. Um, you know, we work with, with everyone. I can't force an entity to... So it's at to, their invitation. Yeah. I mean, not that I want to because it's supposed to be a collaborative thing. So it, we wouldn't be very successful for forcing somebody who didn't want to be there. Um, but this to me is just, this is just good government, um, and it's about having all the right people at the right time and really working together as a team to move forward. Uh, compliance, um, this is not only just with legal re requirements across the board, and this can be with related to exemptions, obviously of, of information, we want to have those protected at a different level, um, but also the agency's own policies and procedures, and, and how is that actually working when it comes to records and information. Um, management, you know, so are the things identified and do the employees actually know um, what their responsibilities are within the particular uh, sets of information they're working with? Um, is it really kind of emphasized in having different kind of auditing, different controls is being reviewed? Compliance is a really big one. The legal community obviously likes this one, but do they always know when the process isn't working very well or do they know where the loopholes are? So having that, comp um, that as being part of the governance component is, is required. Availability, um, accurate and retrieval information. We're running out of time. So you're running oh, out of time. No, you've, you've like I'm almost done. We'll give you five <laughs> minutes. We'll shorten our break. We'll shorten our break. Uh, <laughs> this is a challenge. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hours yes. are spent going through yes. wildcat. Yes. But th these are records that aren't necessarily archived. Right. These, uh, I mean, we, we, we live yeah. the legacy of, you know, I always say even the State Record Center, which was, um, just to digress a little bit, um, <coughs> it, it, you know, it wasn't managed as well. Um, and so it ended up being a place where agencies just would kind of offload paper that they didn't know what to do with and offload in it. It's become a huge liability. So walking through availability, um, right now we actually have someone from DCF, you know, scouring old, old, oh, you know, geez. records that are sitting in the record center in response to lawsuits. Mm -hmm. um, so availability is really a key part. You know, we're doing all this and we're supposed to be managing our records and information in a, in a way that not only do we have accurate and reliable information, but it's available to the right people at the right time. It's not a struggle to find. Of course, we all have the legacy of what we're trying to do, um, and, and so does, um, you know, Secretary Quinn. I always say we're the original server where it's like you don't know until you open up the box. I mean, it's supposed to be something and you open it up and it's office supplies. That wasn't what it was reported to be. The same thing happens on the electronic environment as well. Um, from a library of science and information science background, it's about recall and precision. You know, if someone's doing a search, they should be able to recall everything, get everything that's available for that search, and it should be precise of what they're looking for. Um, that's the goal for this availability. But it needs to be equally balanced with all the other pillars um, for that. And the last one's retention and disposition. So they go hand in hand. How long do we have to keep this information and why? And that's what the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration is actually charged with, making sure that we set the retention requirement. And we do that in collaboration um, with all the public agencies that we work with. So it's not something that I just send out because we really have to understand the bigger picture. We collect every single legal requirement around all that information. It's encoded in part of the schedule. 
Um, we do metadata classification so that they can manage them inside a repository that's going to be reading that information, make sure the records are managed. So retention and last dis disposition. So they're actually disposed when they're required. We have the business processes and the infrastructure in place to actually do that. Um, and disposal, it means two different things. One, if it's a retention and it's appraised as being something that should be destroyed, that is effectively destroyed at all levels, right? And it's effectively destroyed everywhere. <laughs> if, if the goal is to not have it there, we need to know where everything is. And that's the availability factor, right? We don't this always know where everything right. is. Right. Um, disposition in the state of Vermont also can mean disposing for permanent records that they actually get disposed into the state archives. And so that's where we become the legal custodian and we continue them because they have continuing value. Um, final records, great example, continuing value. Um, so those come into the state archives and we administer them um, depending on the age and so forth when the Department of Health feels there will be no corrections or amendments anymore in those. Um, and we do electronic and paper. And so um, just last part of it, unified governance is really all these disciplines together, including security and risk, um, which is kind of a, a newer factor in here. Um, associated costs, just kind of in closing, um, this, this is one that came out of the electronic discovery because they're spending so much time and attorneys trying to find stuff that they can't find is walking through the information governance. So that's actually a really good model to figure out, like when you hear, oh, we had unexpected costs, and they were really surprised, we didn't know this was gonna happen. It's not just on you know certain IT fronts, it could be, well, we didn't know we're gonna expend you know, um, for attorneys to go look for this, or we didn't know that we're gonna have this other human capital cost. When things are surprising and people are reacting to something, that tends to lead to what, what we usually see as a very low information governance. Um, and then, you know, overruns and some unexpected costs because it's ill-fitting. Oh, we bought this, you know, technology and it turned out not to really work very well. That tends to be a lot. There's awareness, but not really quite where we want to be. Um, and when you get to essential, what we're seeing is there's a lot of control cost. Um, there's a lot of reuse of information, so we don't need the same, we don't need 20 agencies compiling the same kind of data. They should be able to leverage the data that we have as a state and go across these. So information exchange gets much stronger. Um, and then proactive is when you see these integrations, and it can be in a business process as well as technology, um, and you're seeing more targeted reductions, like how can we actually streamline this and get it more efficient? Um, and then transformations were really shared across the board and we're really using technology as we want to be using it. Um, so those are direct correlations that have come out in terms of the information governance model. Sorry I talked so fast. But I to <laughs> no, I really appreciate it. And we have time for a couple weeks. So we have 10 minutes before our guests. And I want to make sure we have a five minute break. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Seth? Yeah. Um, Quick question, uh, do you have different levels of uh, disposition based on the sensitivity of the information? Yeah, so in terms of, um, so for disposition, there's two different levels that, we, when we code the record schedules, we do it at a high level that goes kind of across, so we'll do a shred versus a recycle. Um, and there's electronic shredding as well as paper mm -hmm. um, shredding. If it's disposed into the archives, um, you know, there's a whole nother security code that we use on the information. So whether or not it did, we, um, we do four different levels. One is that if, um, based on all the legal requirements, we wouldn't expect something to be in that particular um, set of information. Like someone throws in a social security number on a record, but there's no reason why they should have done that. We mark those as general, which means like the agency should not expect to have anything that's sensitive or secure in that. Review is um, a default that we use when there's kind of a mix, but it's not really clear. Redact um, is another security level that we have when we know that the records themselves or the data related to the registers or databases um, have information that is exempt from public access um, and all the different reasons why, all the legal requirements, and then we have outright exempt. So those things used together, if it says exempt, it's automatically a shred. If it's redact, it's automatically a shred. If it's um, review, we really default to shred, and then it's really, if it's general, then the agency can use a normal recycling component, um, and they can use the tools that are available to them from a paper electronic perspective. Thank so. you. Um, forgive me if, I, if you covered this at the beginning, but I feel like you've sort of outlined here your grading system, and I'm curious if, if 
you have the results for us. I mean, or or you have it <laughs> measured that way. We we um, uh, we do publish them on our website. Okay. Um, I'm happy to send that afterwards. Um, we mm -hmm. haven't updated them. When we first launched it, we did across the board, and the, really the first two pill we started with the first two pillars, um, and um, yeah, we do. We publish it on our website for the executive branch, um, and so. The first thing that we look at, especially the accountability, just to let you know, so under statute for the executive branch for agencies and departments, um, specifically underneath the governor, there is a whole separate statute that requires them to have agency records and information management programs and to assign a member of his or her staff as a records officer. Um, we've been monitoring the appointments of those and then monitoring how well the agency can actually succeed in, in information governance. So if, a, if the appointee has always been at a level that's not a senior level of that, then that got a lower score. Um, I'm happy to show you where it is on my on the website before, but I know that you have it. Or just a link with Mike. Mike. And, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. so I'll send that to yeah. Mike afterwards and then you're able to see that. We haven't updated it. Um, this new version of the law that has a little bit more teeth in it um, came into effect last July. And so what we've been doing is more, um, I have a really tiny, I have 17 people for all our operations. Uh, so I have four people who are records and information management spe specialists who are like spread across every single agency wow. right okay. now and local government. Um, so what we're really doing is um, we actually put a physical person into the agency of human services, which is my staff member in there. Um, and we're really focusing on looking at that modeling that works really well and seeing um, where we can get the most kind of um, opportunities that not only the agency of human services can be successful, but the next agency. But that's half of state government. If I you, know, if well that's, that's my that philosophy that, too. That we might as well start <laughs> on the big one. Yeah. Yeah. I actually yeah. have another staff member too that we, because we actually do take a lot of court records as well. We're the only state that's a statewide court in the nation, right? We don't have, everyone else has county government and county archives, and we have a person that's dedicated directly to collaborating with um, the court of administrator's office on that. But those are, you know, limited resources. So what we haven't done is really try to push this because we recognize we're limited resources, so are the agencies, but let's continue to collaborate together. Yeah. Yeah. Last question. That was my question, okay. the evaluation of the various yeah, agencies. Yeah, so we do publish it and I will, um, okay. yeah. And, and that was something that having the agencies do some self-reporting as well and, um, yeah. And so you obviously have an ongoing program. Mm -hmm. We oh yeah, this is this is continuous. Okay. Um, the Agency of Human Services is the best example right now of having a very active um, strategy to do this. Um, very good collaboration within there. Um, Diva in particular has been really. Um, they have been, you know, they have been way low, um, but really have having come up. And it, it's about that team and that collaboration. When we don't have that, we just know it won't be successful in any area. Right. Thank you. Yeah, really. thank you. For thank you for your flexibility. Oh, yeah. We appreciate it. Okay, let's uh, break to. You were kind enough to um, uh, bring us a re what you hoped was a resource. I've been asking you um, really about. What